Hello everyone, I'm Tamara Banks and welcome to this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. Mitch, always great to see you. Good to see you, Tamara. We are talking about a really important topic uh, today, uh, traumatic brain injury. And Judy, welcome to the show. And, and Debbie, thank you so much for thank being you. here. Judy, why don't we start with you first. Tell us a little bit about what really is TBI and some of the differences between, say, TBI and a concussion or just a little knock mm -hmm. on the head. Good question. Um, traumatic brain injury in definition is an external blow to the head. So concussion actually fits under the category of traumatic brain injury. There are ranges of severity with brain injury and that's where concussion maybe is more on a mild, medically mild end of brain injury, but is still a brain injury nonetheless. So that's the definition and folks with brain injury can range from having been knocked out or as people say, got their bell rung in terms of sports or activity to having sustained a coma um, from their brain injury. So it ranges that severity. So what does the Colorado Brain Injury Program do then address all the issues surrounding TBI? We do. The Brain Injury Program, I would say, has three different facets. One is that we do a lot of education in terms of what is brain injury for our community and our state, um, as well as for other state agencies. I sit within a state agency, so I work a lot with our sister agencies and help them understand what brain injury is, how can you most effectively serve folks with brain injury. Um, the other piece is we provide services. We have a trust fund in Colorado where we collect surcharges on DUI, DWAI, and speeding convictions. And that builds this fund in which we spend um, approximately 65% of those funds toward case management services, classes, workshops for adults, and then education consultation and case management for youth with brain injury. We also do research around brain injury. We feel it's, that's a critical element that often gets overlooked with programming in terms of how do we understand what brain injury is, how do we improve the lives of folks through that understanding and education, like I said previously. Wow, it sounds pretty comprehensive. It is, yeah. And Debbie, let me bring you into the conversation. Talk a little bit about your experience with TBI and how it impacted your family. Well, in 1997, my oldest son was hit by a car here in Denver and sustained a severe traumatic brain injury. He was in a coma for four months and um, basically had to learn everything all over again. Uh, I have two younger children and it impacted the entire family. So, uh, because so much attention has to be afforded to that person with the brain injury because they are starting from square one again. Mm -hmm. And so that was 20 some odd years ago? Mm -hmm. And how is he doing now? Uh, well, he, he is doing very well. He's gotten married. He can hold a part-time job. Uh, he has a daughter and he does fairly well. Uh, you know, he'll never be 100%, but he does very, very well okay. considering the severity of his injury and the uh, amount of physical deficits that he still has. And did you get help from the Colorado Brain Injury Program? We did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that there's a correlation, or there could be a correlation between brain injury of uh, any sort and possible violence. Mm -hmm. am, am I making a stretch there? No, Judy? you're not making a stretch mm -hmm. at all. I mean, violence can be the cause of the brain injury, whether through assaults. I call it violence when you're drinking and driving and operating a vehicle. Um, and if you hit someone, there's a violence to that. Also, folks with brain injury due to poor impulse control or judgment or inability to inhibit sometimes will be perpetrators of violence, mm -hmm. um, so maybe through domestic violence or other types of assault. And so much Tamara, we see it in, a, in different ways, and I think that I can give you some examples. Sometimes victims mm -hmm. that will suffer that kind of injury and be put into comas and situations like that. Currently we have a Denver police officer who is in a coma from being run over by a car and dragged almost an entire block under the car. Some of that is medically induced just to keep him alive. Um, but I think that many people, then the other thing we will see is that lack of impulse control. And I've handled cases where you have a defendant that has uh, suffered a severe injury, maybe a motorcycle accident. I had an individual that did that and then he lived in an apartment. Um, it was one of Denver Housing Authority apartments and he would, he had no impulse control when it came to women. So a woman would walk by him and he would grab them inappropriately. He would grope them. He would grab them, he would touch them between the legs, things like that. And we charged him. 
and he could not communicate with his lawyers because he couldn't do anything in his own defense because his injury was so severe. So what we did in that situation, we, he was found to be incompetent permanently, mm -hmm. which meant he didn't go to jail. It meant that he went to a place where he could get services that he needed. Uh, I think that probably one of the most dramatic ones I've ever seen, and most people will remember when we had Travis Ford, Forbes kidnap that 19-year-old girl off yeah. the streets of Denver. He murdered her and buried her out in Keensburg. But he went up to Fort Collins and he brutally raped a woman up there. He followed her home from the 4th of July. He brutally beat her and he lit her apartment on fire, hoping that she'd die in the fire. She was able to get out. She actually dropped two floors. And when they found her, she went into a coma. She was in a coma for a long time. And if you watch, I think Dateline did a show on her. And they watched the step by step that she had to go through. Mm -hmm. That she had to learn how to talk again. And, and just the impact on her, what this guy did to her. You know, just, he did everything short of kill her. He raped her, he beat her, he lit her place on fire. And he, she was a school teacher who then had to just herself learn how to talk learn how to walk, learn how to do all those things that those of us that haven't suffered this kind of injury take for granted all the time. You get up out of a chair, you walk, you get what you want, you do what you want. People that suffer these injuries and if they're victims of crime, they've been hit by a car, something like that, I, it just it is a life-changing situation. It really is. And, and it is really difficult for a lot of times I've seen it with elderly men that were beaten by individuals. Mm -hmm. They already were at a stage where their brains were starting to dementia and things, and that was all just sped up. Mm -hmm. And you know, people will actually victimize people if they think they're weak, if they think that they are somebody they can get over on, if they are somebody that has suffered this kind of injury. And you know, that part of it. Um, for me is one of the reasons why when we catch somebody like Mr. Forbes we make sure they go, mis they go to prison for as long as we can put them there because they target people and you know they, they re ruin people's lives. Right. I covered that case and it was just astounding to see as you said what happened to the, the woman in Fort Collins in particular and of course the young woman who was killed and so with the woman in Fort Collins you talked about Mitch the, the um, recovery that she had. Talk a little bit, Judy, about what light there is at the end of the tunnel, if you will, for people. They don't have to just stay in that state after being so traumatized, TBI in particular. Sure. sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of great rehabilitation available for folks with brain injury in terms of speech language, occupational therapy, physical therapy. It's intensive and it's really like a full-time job following brain injury. I'm sure Debbie would relate to that with her son, um, but through rehab and, and just years of learning to compensate for your injury, you really do continue to make gains. Mm -hmm. um, I, previous to this job, used to work in employment with folks with brain injury and met people 20, 30 years post-injury who were still figuring out different ways to rewire their brain in terms of, okay, I can't remember things, therefore I have to write this down or I can't um, control my impulses, so maybe what I need is a, a stopwatch to kind of remind me to think about what I'm doing. Just different strategies that folks can learn in terms of how to get along mm -hmm. with, the, with the injury. It is life-altering, it, it impacts the entire family and, and community around that person, but they certainly can continue to live and um, in a lot of cases find employment or live independently following a brain injury. Debbie, can you tell us a little bit about um how your son is doing specifically, maybe some stories you have about where he started right after the accident to where he is today. Well, he had to, uh, like Mitch has mentioned, he did have to, he had to learn how to breathe on his own. He had to learn he how to breathe on his mm -hmm. own. He had to learn how to swallow. Mm -hmm. He had to learn how to talk and walk. Uh, and it affected everything, all of his cognitive abilities. And we kind of learned that uh, the, the brain injury, it slows everything down for quite some time. And we had to learn to 
uh, like write things down for him because then he could read it and process it in his own way and then give you an answer. Um, but he went through the wheelchair phase and uh, living in assisted living, having to learn how to, to live in the public again and to adjust with his injury because cognitively he didn't understand and sometimes even now uh, the understanding of some situations is difficult. His memory obviously is nowhere near what it used to be. Um, and I think uh, it depends on what the person was like prior to the injury as to kind of how they're going to recover. Um, he was, their personality and I, how, how, I believe that has how a lot strong to do they with are it. personality wise. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I believe that has a lot to do with it. That and what kind of a support system each individual has. And that's where the trust fund comes in too because they have support groups where family members can go and survivors of brain injury which help them understand that they're not the only ones in this situation and what they hear in their head mm -hmm. is like many others which is someplace where we will never be um, because we we can't get in their head and see how they are um, comprehending everything right. but his memory and and cognitively you know he does lack behind um, because of the of the accident and uh, it's, it's he progresses mm -hmm. every, every year I see him progress and then sometimes I see him regress and uh, so he's always playing catch-up right. and uh, the public in general treats individuals when they don't understand that they have a brain injury because it's it's like a silent um, disease type of thing right. they don't understand why a person talks the way they do or um, asks the questions that they do or react to certain stimulus the way they do mm -hmm. which is different from people without a TBI right can you talk um, Judy about the uh, I'm thinking about the money that it takes to help people mm -hmm. like Debbie's son grants how does that all come together that's a good question and, uh, <laughs> piece together tightly, I guess. Um, I think there's a great deal of insurance funds typically for folks initially at rehab. So they go through the hospitalization, they go through rehab, and there's funds typically through insurance or Medicaid or some other um, provider that can help cover those costs. Mm -hmm. Where we run into trouble is the lifelong needs of folks with brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, so brain injury doesn't just end when they leave the hospital or leave the rehab facility. That's Honestly, where a lot of the hard work for families and, and the community come into play because now they're trying to figure out how do I live with this injury? And then we don't have any insurance dollars left and all this thing. So um, the trust fund certainly is helpful in the state of Colorado in terms of being able to have funds to provide that case management support, get them connected to services. Medicaid often ends up being um, one of the payers for folks if they don't have the ability to go back to work full time. Or if they're working full time, then a lot of times they have their own insurance. But mm -hmm. it's really those community resources that are tough, tough to find. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I imagine it's hard to get those those funds. And you started talking about that. Drill down a little bit more about what you have to go through to get those, and how sure. how does that how is that fund supported? Sure. So in 2002, there was a statute written and passed in terms of collecting surcharges on DUI DWAI. So for every DUI DWAI conviction, and that's kind of a important word in that, um, we received $20 in terms of a surcharge. Um, and one of the challenges related to that that we've learned over the years in managing this fund is that when people can't pay their surcharges, when you get a DUI, DWAI, it's, it's a great deal of money in terms of fines and fees. And um, so oftentimes counties will work with individuals on how to pay those fees. It gets paid over time and ours is traumatic brain injury trust fund, so it's on the bottom of the list in the alphabet. Mm. Therefore, we don't always get the surcharges because people have the inability to pay for those surcharges or it takes that long to receive those funds. So that's one challenge. The other is um, we also receive funds from speeding convictions. And in terms of municipal speeding violations or convictions, it's up to the city whether or not they want to adopt that surcharge or not. Um, in Colorado, we're a home rule state. Um, and folks have that, or cities have that option to adopt sa certain state surcharges, and this is one of those. And so given that, we probably have only about 20 or so uh, municipalities currently paying for this, and that's, um, there's 271 municipalities. So I see it as a glass kind of half 
full. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity there uh, in terms of working with municipalities and trying to figure out how do we educate them about the importance of these funds and helping to entice them and get them to understand why they might want to start collecting the surcharge. So that's some of the work we're doing currently. You know, Tamara, it's, it, you know, it's one of the most frustrating things we deal with. You're sitting there in front of a judge, the person saying, I don't have the ability to pay this. Well, how much is that cell phone costing you a month? How much is your cable back at home? And you know, and I wish there was some honesty when it came to that kind of thing, that we can show the person's paying for cable, they have a, a laptop that plugs into the internet that costs them a certain amount every month, they have their cell phone, state-of-the-art iPhone, but they can't pay this $20. I mean, uh, it, it's one of, big, one of my biggest frustrations, being in, in a DA's office, listening to that, watching that, and knowing full well that that is just flat out not true. Uh, and as far as the cities go, I think that cities need to realize that the taxpayers are paying a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So why don't we make the speeders pay? And it's a fee then that doesn't come from those of us that choose to abide by the law. And it helps then those services that I know the city of Denver is providing a lot or is having to pay costs or charge somebody that has one of these injuries that wouldn't be in the criminal justice system at all if they were getting funds from the trust fund. And I think sometimes if cities would just open their eyes and realize this is costing us this much, if we were getting that money from speeders going in and sharing this money, we would save money and that would help our tax base. Uh, and I think that sometimes city leaders and governmental people just don't see common sense sometimes. And obviously you can't do the work that you need to do, that you do in the community um, without the money and you wouldn't even be able to get the help that you needed from your son. I mean can right. you imagine if he hadn't had the support of the Colorado TBI agency program? Right. That and uh, the families wind up carrying a lot of that burden. Uh, people with traumatic brain injuries a lot of times wind up on Medicaid, Medicare, uh, which again taxes the system um, because they can't perform the duties that they used to before so it's a vicious circle and uh, obviously they lose their income ability a lot of times so it uh, it hurts everybody involved um, mm -hmm. that is dealing with the traumatic brain injury. But Tamara let me tell you that I, I can I have seen amazing things around these injuries People remember Brant Brantz. He raped a lot of women in our city. The last woman he attacked, he didn't sexually assault. He beat her with a two-by-four. And the first time I saw her was down in Denver Health, the critical care unit. They had just removed a portion of her brain. Mm. She was a young, beautiful woman. Tiffany Engel is her name. That's right. The next time I saw Tiffany was at Craig Hospital. And I've got to tell you, Craig Hospital is a place that does miracles for people of all kinds of injuries, including these kinds of injuries. And we are lucky to have a place like Craig in the Denver metropolitan region. They made her wear a hockey helmet um, and she had really recovered, started to recover. The saddest thing for her is she had moved here, I think from Nebraska or somewhere, and this injury was gonna force her to have to go back home and go back. And all of the things that she thought she had strived her independence, all those things were being taken away from her. So not only had she suffered this severe brain injury where actually part of her brain had died, she also had a setback in her own, what she, was her life, was you know what her goals and all of that. And then the last time I saw her, I gave her an award and she had fully recovered and all of these people that had given her services and everything, and it was just amazing. And when I say fully recovered, she said, well, I have permanent vertigo. I'll never be able to fly an airplane. Uh, and I said, well, you know, okay, Tiffany. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think that the, the thing to keep in mind is this is so important, but also that, like we talked about, there are professionals out there working. There are families out there working to make a difference. And you know the people that really work hard are the people that have suffered these injuries because they want to get back to where they were. Right. 
That's right. And you know, they know that they're not going to be able to unless they work really hard at it. We touched on this um, a little bit earlier in the show, but Mitch, I'd like you to talk about, is there, can you, are there any stats that point to this um, defendant, this suspect, and maybe somebody who was actually convicted, did have TBI, and that's why they committed this crime. Are you able to track how many of those incidents have been, have resulted uh, because this person had TBI? Well, you know, it, in the severe situations we're talking about, where, where you're talking about a car accident, Mm -hmm. or we're talking about somebody beating somebody with a two by four or that type of thing, shooting someone. But I think people have got to keep in mind, you know, we have a lot of kids that suffer a lot of severe beatings, a lot of child abuse, and it's repeated and it's over and over. And so, you know, some if you have a child that's getting struck in the head over and over and then as they grow up, they may very well suffer mm -hmm. from those kinds of injuries and that might lead, that might have an impact on impulse control, on the kinds of things that do get you into the criminal justice system. Uh, our hope is that with some of the specialty courts that we have now, that somebody recognizes that and puts them on a track where, okay, this, this young man assaulted a police officer, but this is why. This person is not a sociopath. This person is somebody that has suffered this injury over time, or there's a brain injury because of a disease or an injury that they have, and you can point to that and then understand it and then treat it even though we are not a medical, but, but treat it in a way in the criminal justice system that makes some sense, right. that actually, you know, why would you fill a prison cell with someone that you know is not going to do this if you treat them the way they need to be treated. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal and that's where we've gone a lot recently and we still have huge steps to take to recognize this and make sure that we're treating it appropriately in our system. Mm -hmm. So often our system is the last standing place where if somebody had gotten the treatment, you know, if the trust fund if people had gotten in place before the criminal act, we, would, we wouldn't engage. Okay. But now we're there, we have to engage, and we have to make sure that we understand what we're dealing with and treating it appropriately. Just some final comments from you, um, Debbie, about how you would tell people how important the Colorado Brain uh, Trauma in, uh, Program is, B TBI. Uh, and I think that's one of my goals, uh, is to make sure um, that the community has a better understanding of how prevalent this is, um, all the different ways that this can happen, the uh, situations that their children are in that can create that. And I want the public to understand that and to have more knowledge of, of what to look for, how to treat it, and where to get the support and the, the treatment that's needed. And um, to me, that's very important mm -hmm. uh, for families and for families to make sure that they have support and um, that they support that person with the TBI because that's without that support that person will continue to spiral and wind up uh, in a place where they never wanted to be where they don't want to be and where they don't understand why such things have happened so that's why I work with the trust fund that's why I do the job that I do and uh, to try and, and keep that knowledge out there and to educate the community and families. Well, thank you so much for being thank here you. and sharing your story. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Judy, keep up the great work. It's thank really you. incredible work that you're doing there thank with the Colorado TBI uh, program. I appreciate it. That's all the time we have tonight. Uh, thank you to Judy Detmer and Debbie Boyle of the Colorado Brain Injury Program for being our guests with Mitch Morsey on this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. I'm Tamara Banks. We'll see you next time. <music>